أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون ولقد خلقنا الإنسان من سلالة من طين ثم جعلناه نطفة في قرار مكين ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين ثم إنكم بعد ذلك لميتون ثم إنكم يوم القيامة تبعثون ولقد خلقنا فوقكم سبع طرائق وما كنا عن الخلق غافلين وأنزلنا من السماء ماء بقدر فأسكناه في الأرض وإنا على ذهاب به لقادرون فأنشأنا لكم به جنات من نخيل وأعناب لكم فيها فواكه كثيرة ومنها تأكلون صدق الله العظيم We were talking about the beginning ayahs of Surah Al-Mu'minun in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us about who are the true successful believers and he mentioned seven different types of behaviors or akhlaq or things that we need to adopt in order to for us to be successful believers starting with alladhina hum fi salatihim khashi'un and then we were talking about in the previous session we talked about وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ Those who are true with their trust and with their promises, with their covenants. We talked about amana, trust in Islam, and the importance of it in the previous session. After that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَهْد that they take care of their promises. There are two words used in Arabic language for promise. One is wa'ad and the other is ahd. There is a little difference between the two. Wa'ad with wa'u means general promise that you would make to any person. And ahd means a promise where you would even confirm it with an oath. In Sharia, it is extremely important that when a person makes a promise, we fulfill our promise. If we look at it, although it seems that something very simple, I'm not able, so I can't do it. I can't go, so that's fine. But in reality, if we look at it, Sharia is so careful about how we treat others, how we deal with people, and not to hurt people, not to disturb people in any way, shape, or form. Sharia is very careful about it. And here also we see how Sharia is teaching us to be very careful of not hurting people. You made a promise. Say for example, you promised me that you would see me today in the masjid at Zohar time. Now after Zohar, I'm waiting for you. You got busy. You are doing something else. It did not hurt you because you are doing your work. But what's happening to me at this time? You took half an hour of my time and I'm just waiting, doing nothing, just waiting for you to come. And at the end, I leave with disturbance that I don't know you may have come after I left. So that thing is bothering me. 
and you became the cause for all of this. So this is how Sharia is teaching us the other. Subhanallah, what a beautiful other of dealing with each other. And we need to remember, when a person takes an appointment, a doctor's office, lawyer's office, anywhere, we make an appointment, then we don't keep up with our appointment. Of course, that person have kept that time for us. Now you don't cancel it. This was a wa'ad, when, when you call and make an appointment, it's a wa'ad. It's a promise that I will come at your office at 10.30. And then, all of a sudden I thought, you know, I don't want to go today, I'll go tomorrow. So the least is, I tell you that I'm not coming so that you don't wait. There is also a promise. We see that these things, normally we consider them as part of our normal life, that I made a promise, I keep it or I break it. Something that I have to look at what the law of the country says about it, okay, I will not be held responsible, so that's fine. Or the other thing is, let me read the terms and conditions for joining this office, and if I don't keep up with my promise, what they are going to do to me, they won't give me an appointment next time, or there is nothing written like this, <laughs> so they can't hold me responsible for anything, okay, now I don't have to go, and I don't have to cancel it. All of this is, it seems like it has nothing to do with religion, and for most of the people, these things have nothing to do with religion. But this is the beauty of Islam, that Islam makes all of these things part of our deen, and teaches us that how should we deal with others. To this level, that you made a promise, keep it because you are going to be hurting others. And if this becomes a situation in the society, Generally, this is the situation in the society that everyone breaks the promise. Every person calls the office, doctor's office, make an appointment, and half of these people won't come. So now the doctor knows that half of the people will not be coming out of these people who promised to come and who took an appointment. So what he's going to do, he will be making appointments for one and a half time the people that he can see on that day. So, he's making more appointments in order because he knows that half of the people won't come. Now, say all of a sudden, that day, everyone went. What will happen? It will be overcrowded. We will have to wait for longer. This is just one example. You've sent this example everywhere in our life that we promise each other and the general habit is we always break our promise. So now, I would think you always break the promise, so you're not going to, there is no need for me to go there, because I know you may not come. And all of a sudden, that day you came. Now, you're wasting your time. So, this is how the whole si system will be corrupted. <laughs> Look at the beauty. Small things. Small things. If we take care of them, they could be very helpful in developing a healthy society. And these very minor things, they could really destroy the whole society. They could disturb our work, our system, and everything. Come tomorrow, I'll do the work. And you come tomorrow, okay, come the day after, come the day after. No work is getting done. This is the normal situation with a, in a lot of offices and a lot of countries. And then people lose trust. And people don't try to avoid going to these people. And now these people see that people are avoiding them, so now they give them even harder time. Okay, he was forced to come to me, let me give him a hard time. And the whole system gets corrupted. This word, wa'ad, seems a very simple thing, but really, it's a big thing in developing a good society. Not just taking care of the whole society, even within a family. If there are only two people in the family, Husband and wife, they go out, wherever they go, education, work, what time are you going to be home? I'll be home at 6 o'clock. Okay. I will be also, I will make sure that I'll come home at 6 o'clock. Now, she comes home 6 o'clock, and she finds out that he's not home until 8 o'clock. Okay, that's fine. One day, second day, third day. Now, after that, she knows that he just says, promises to come at 6, but he never comes before 8. Okay. 
Now she's going to take over her work in order that she would come at 8 o'clock. After some time, this gentleman started coming at 6 o'clock, and now he's so upset that I have to wait two hours. The whole system, everything gets corrupted in the system when the wa'ad is not there, when the promises are not being fulfilled. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he mentioned the sign of, signs of nifaq, the three major signs of nifaq, one of them is, وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفْ Munafiq, he breaks the promise whenever he makes it. But at the same time, we need to remember, what does breaking the promise mean? Breaking the promise does not mean that at the time of making the promise, you were sure that you're going to make it. And this is why you promised. Later on, all of a sudden, something came up. Now, if you are not making up for that time, for that promised time, from the Sharia point of view, this is not called breaking the promise. As long as you're doing your best, and at the time of making the promise, it was your intention that you would keep it up. But something happened and you couldn't. There are people who are a little careless. They'll make four or five appointments at the same time. You tell them, brother, you know, I need a ride from you. Don't worry, brother. Salat al zuhr I'll be there. And another brother meets him. He says, you know, I need help with shopping. Don't worry, brother. One o'clock, I'll take you for shopping. Now, all of a sudden, those two brothers are waiting. And all of a sudden, one o'clock, someone knocks at his home. He says, brother, I need you here. Come on, let's go for outing. Mashallah, let's go. <laughs> He's gone. The other two brothers are waiting. We can call him very neglectful. Whatever other words you can <coughs> use for him. But this brother, really, this person is not considered to be a person who breaks the promise. Because when he was making it, really, it was his intention. That I'll do this, and I'll do this, and I'll do that. This is his habit. He promises everyone, I'll do it. And he has the intention of doing it, and never remembers that I promised three, four people at the same time. It's not a good habit. I'm not saying that this is something good. But, this is for us, the reason I'm using this example, because so that we can very clearly understand the difference between being neglectful, or being forgetful, and for breaking the promise. There is difference between these things. Breaking the promises, I promised you, then I promised the other person, and I know, I remember that I have promised that person also. And I know I won't be able to keep up that promise, and I'm then making a promise with you. This is breaking the promise. Why should I make a promise with you, whereas I know that I have already promised the other person at this time? This is breaking the promise. But, at the time of making the promise with you, I don't remember that I made a promise with that person. Or I think, you know, I'll be done with that person in five minutes, then I'll come to you. Then I'll be done with you in ten minutes, then I'll go to that person. And then I go to this person and I spend an hour with him. This is not considered, from the Sharia point of view, is not considered breaking the promise as long as the person's intention is that he would keep it. And he would fulfill all of these promises. Then all of a sudden he starts falling short. Or... Say God forbid, or some situation come up in his life where he he cannot make it. He had a flat tire as he was going there. He cannot make it. Although nowadays, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us one thing that may be ni'mah in this situation, and that is our cell phones. In a lot of situations it may not be, but sometimes it's ni'mah also. When people keep on calling you and then it rings even when you're in salah and when you're in the bathroom. It's going to just keep on ringing all the time. But it is a ni'mah if we use it the right way. And since we have that ability of letting the person know that you won't be able to keep up with your promise, you won't be able to do it, then it's part of our responsibility of fulfilling the promise, then we let the person know that I won't be able to keep up this promise. So, Sharia is very particular about keeping the promise. And there are a lot of ayahs in Quran, a lot of hadith that talk about it. And I give you the gist of it, that why it's so important from the Sharia point of view. Because it helps to develop a good society, relationship between the people, 
even within the same, within one family, and of course, uh, in the whole society, that everyone trusts other people. Yes, he promised he's going to come. I will give him the time at the time. I will keep myself free also for him because I promised him and he promised me he would be coming. So it is very healthy society whereas, where everyone is keeping up the promise. And most of the time, our dealings depend on promises. Store owners, they bring a product to you most of that is promises. They have been promised by the factory that they will get the delivery on such and such date. And accordingly, they tell their customers that on that day, we will have this merchandise available for you. And it may be that the person they are buying from, he is just a wholesaler, and he buys it from another country, and they are promising him. So it's a chain of promises. And if one person in between breaks that promise, the whole chain gets disturbed. And everyone is just hanging there. Everyone says, you know, I couldn't do it. Everyone is ashamed because of just that one person's fault who does not fulfill his promise. He just makes a promise. So this is why Sharia is very... See, we can see the beauty of the Sharia that looks like something very simple, very minor. Okay, fulfill your promise, but it's very deep. And this is why Sharia considers this breaking the promise, considers it and considers it to be a, a sin. And uh, I won't call it one of the, the major sin in Islam, but it is not a norm. It's not a normal sin either, because it's considered to be sign of nifaq, and signs of nifaq are not minor ones. Then we need to remember. As Sharia emphasizes on fulfilling the promise, there are two different things in Sharia. One is, Sharia sometimes gives us an order, and that order has to be fulfilled because we are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and because we are the believers, and we don't want to be sinners by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are certain rulings in Sharia, where not only that the person would get a sin if he would go against it, there can be a ruling issued against this person. A ruling could be issued by a Muslim judge against this person. When it comes to breaking the promise, if it is an Islamic state, and you take the person to the court, you file a case against the person, that he, bra he broke the promise with me. He promised that he will see me in the masjid at this time, or he will uh, come to my home at that time, and he never came. From the Sharia point of view, the judge cannot issue any ruling against this. But the point is, this person would be considered to be a sinner, and this is a bad sin, or a bad habit also, for a person to be breaking the promise. But there is another thing, that is called mu'ahada in Arabic language. This is ahd, and that is mu'ahada. Mu'ahada means a covenant, where from two sides, both of us, we made an agreement. You will give me the merchandise at this time, and I will pay you at this time. This is an agreement from both sides. When there is a covenant that is from both sides, then this is not only a promise of one side, this is from both sides, that is something where a person not only will be sinful, in fact, a ruling can be issued from the Sharia point of view by a Muslim judge, a ruling can be issued against this person for not fulfilling that covenant, and he could be uh, punished from the Islamic point of view, judge whatever punishment he would assign for him, he, would, he could be punished for that also. So this is the difference between Ahad and Mu'ahada. So we got three words there. One was Wa'ad, the other one was Ahad, and the third word is Mu'ahada. And I mentioned the difference between all three of them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went for the battle of Badr, there were only 313 Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'een facing 1,000 warriors who are well equipped with all kind of weapons that were available to them in those days. 
And here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam are empty-handed. Majority of them, they don't even have a shield and not even a sword in their hand. Some of them are in the battlefield with a stick in their hands. What are they going to do with the stick? And no shield. A person comes to you with a sword. Say even if that person doesn't have a shield, nothing. You hit him with a stick. He's going to take that and hit you with a sword. But that's totally a different story and their iman and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them. But in that type of situation, of course, a person would look for any type of help. We are stuck in this situation. We see that these are thousand warriors in front of us and they are well equipped with all kinds of weapons and we have nothing. So any help we can get at this time it will be a great thing for us to have. And in these type of situation, of course, people like us, we will try to grab whatever we can. Let's get anything. In that situation, two people came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Huzayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father al-Yaman. They both approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before the battle started. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we are here to help you. MashaAllah, <coughs> very nice. Then they went on to tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the full story of their hijrah, that Ya Rasulullah, we were coming to Medina. And on the way, we didn't know about this battle, we didn't know about anything. On the way, we saw this whole huge army, Abu Jahl leading it, the army of Quraysh. They were heading towards Medina. And they captured us. Abu Jahl asked us, where are you people going? We said, we are going to Yathrib. They, call, they used to call it Yathrib in those days. He said, for what? And we just made up something. So he said, no, I think you are going to bother to help the Prophet wasallam." So he promised him, no, that's not our intention. We are not going there for that. We didn't even know that there was a battle taking place. And that was true, they didn't know this. So he said, you promised me you are not going there to help him? Yeah, we promised. We are not going there to help him. We were going to Medina. He said, okay, I'll let you go. Now they come to Badr. Through Abu Jahl and that army, they found out that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam will be at that place in Badr. He's not in Medina. So they changed the direction and they went to Badr. And they approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what happened and he let us go and now here we are, we are, here we are to help you, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Huzayfa and his father al-Yaman radiallahu anhumah that then I'm sorry, I cannot get any help from you people. Because you promised them that you will not help me. Subhanallah. In that situation where the kuffar took a promise from these people that you would not help him in the battle of Badr. And they promised him, he said, since you promised him that you will not help me in the battle of Badr, then both of you go to Medina. I, I won't take any help from you. وَالَّذِينَهُمْ Here we can understand. وَالَّذِينَهُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ And those who are true to, to their trust and their covenants. وَالَّذِينَهُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ And those who are consistent in making their prayers. Basically, حفاظ, محافظة, means that you take care of something, protect something. حفيظ, protection, the one who would protect. And this word is used in Urdu also, حفاظة. So, and generally is used in Arabic language. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who protect their prayers, the first ayah was about those who are humble in their salah, they have khushur in their salah. And this ayah again, this is the last description. And again it's about salah. But another something else about salah, and that is 
ala salawatihim yuhafizun that those who take care of their salah those who protect their prayers what does it mean protecting the prayer means protecting him in every way <coughs> making sure hifaz ala salah means that we do the salah on time we don't let this time go out without doing the salah. This is protecting our salah. You have his own, that they take care of it. They protect it. They don't let the time go out. Also, protecting the salah means that when the person is doing the salah, gives the salah the time that it deserves. You don't break the salah apart. Which means, you give the sujood, if the sujood needs a minute from you, 30 seconds from you, you don't finish the sujood in 20 seconds because you broke it apart. Something that was supposed to be done in 30 seconds, you broke it, you just finished it in 20 seconds. So you, don't, you did not take care of it. I sent you someone and I said, please take care of him. He has a need from you and you can fulfill his need. Please take care of him. That person comes to you and he was talking to you and tell him, you know, I'm busy right now. You sit here, let me finish my work. And you never turn to this person throughout the day. If that person would come, to, would come back to me and tell me this, I would tell you, you did not take care of it. So salah needs time. If it requires five minutes, six minutes, finishing it before that, we are breaking it apart. So this is against muhafazat salah taking care of our salah. It also includes that after you have done the salah, after you finish doing the salah, that we take care of the salah, that we don't destroy it. We don't destroy the salah after doing it. And that is, a person performs the salah, goes out and he gets involved in haram. He is destroying his salah, because these sins are destroying the rewards that you have earned. Or, after performing the salah, the person tells her, well, look, all of these people, they don't come for salah. It was only me and him. Sometime in good terms only to remind people to come for salah is different, but when it comes out of arrogance or showing off, this person is not taking care of salah, he's destroying the salah. So, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ Those who are consistent and they protect their prayers, those are the inheritors who will inherit the paradise whom fiha khalidun they will be in it forever so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these people who have these qualities seven things that are mentioned in these ayahs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who would have these seven qualities these people are guaranteed the jannah and the word that Allah used in this ayah is أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ They are the inheritors. What does inheritance mean? Someone died and we take over that person's asset. We got the wealth without earning it. We really did not do anything to earn it. It was that person who died and he left it for us. And we just got it. And the gift is such where this thing, this gift is for us for sure. No one else can get it. From the Sharia point of view, if anyone else will take that wealth, it's haram for him to take it. So it's guaranteed that this is mine. This portion is mine. No one else can take it. This is what virasa means. Inheritance means. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these actions are liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you do these things, when you have these seven qualities in you, Allah loves you so much that He will give you, give you the Jannah. Although, through your deeds, you have not earned it. And of course, as we know through the hadith, no one can earn the Jannah through his deeds. We work so hard. We work so hard in this world. And after working so hard and earning and all of this, you look at the situation of our houses. What are they comparing to Jannah? Nothing. This is garbage. And not only this is garbage comparing to Jannah, there is no comparison there. Most of the times, 
we get the best we can. And then you go and look at someone else's house and you feel, oh, this is what I need. And we don't like ours anymore. And here, all of a sudden, subhanAllah, this is the situation of this dunya. Take a person who may have the best house in this country, in the whole country. Now, this person goes to some other country and he sees people's living standard over there and he sees things over there and all of a sudden he feels that, okay, I want to leave that country and come and live over here. No one is satisfied in this dunya. And this is the person who has the best. And see, if a person really gets the best in this world, he gets a lot of wealth and he gets everything, how much is he going to get? No one can own the whole dunya. Every person, millions of people that are living, they are going to share the dunya with him for sure. And even if a person will get this whole dunya, this whole world, this world comes nothing with nothing except more and more hardships and problems. The more you have, it's added problem for sure. Preserving it, increasing it, saving it, and now protecting it from robbers, from others. So it comes with all of that. The more the person has, the more responsibilities, the more hardships, the more problems, and you see that people are not able to sleep. Why? Because he has a lot. The days when he didn't have this much, he used to sleep very nice, alhamdulillah. But now he can't. So even if a person would have the whole dunya, say someone got it, still what this dunya is comparing to the akhirah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, لَوْ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا تَعْدِلُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَاحَ بَعُوضًا If the whole world would, would worth even as much as a wing of a mosquito to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, مَا سَقَى كَافِرًا مِنْهَا شَرْبَةَ مَا He would not give a kafir a sip of water. If this whole dunya would worth even a wing of a mosquito to Allah, He will not give a kafir a sip of water from this dunya. But it doesn't worth anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just imagine this whole dunya doesn't worth even a wing of a mosquito. Now to understand our situation in this dunya, there are about 200 countries in this world. At present, this world is divided into 200 countries. Our country is just one of those 200 countries that are in the world, regardless of the portion, small or big. But this is one of those 200 countries. Divide, take a wing of a mosquito, try to cut it, if you can, into 200 pieces. Cut the wing of a mosquito into 200 pieces, and our country is one of those small pieces that we get from there, if it would worth that much. And it doesn't even worth this much. SubhanAllah. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that this dunya doesn't worth anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No conversion between the blessings of Akhirah, of Jannah, and things that we have in this dunya. But it's still, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, the least any person would get in Jannah is ten times the space of this dunya. This is the least that any person would have, ten times, not the blessings that we have here, this is nothing. Ten times, he's just talking about the space. Ten times the space of this dunya. This is the least a person would have in Jannah. And everyone else will have more than that. This is the least. SubhanAllah. And here we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghani, totally independent. To him, these things mean nothing. How much? This counting is only for us. I can count only 30 on my fingers. I can count only 100 on my fingers. We have very limited things. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these counts mean nothing. When He gives, He just opens the doors and you just get it. And there are some ayahs that are coming next that would we'll talk about it. Inshallah, we will go back to that topic once we get to those ayahs. The point I was mentioning here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we will inherit the Jannah. We will not, we cannot earn the Jannah. Our deeds are not enough to buy us the Jannah because with the hardest work that we offer, we cannot buy even the whole dun this dunya. 
no matter how much a person would earn, and he would like to offer everyone that, okay, you go out of this dunya, let me buy your house, we won't do it. Everyone would share it. So we cannot even earn the dunya by our hard work. Imagine earning the jannah, how can we earn it? There is no way. So how can we get the jannah? Is we work very hard to make sure that we get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prove ourselves that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prove that you love Allah and you work for the sake of the deen of Allah and you work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that thing is proven that Allah is pleased with you and He will just give you the Jannah as a gift. This is Ula'ika humul warithun. These are the inheritors, Alladina yarithun al firdaus, who would inherit al firdaus, which means Jannah. And firdaus is the highest position of Jannah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Firdaus a'la al-jannah wa awsatuha. Firdaus is in the higher position of the jannah, in the middle of the jannah. People with these qualities, they will inherit al-firdaus. And not only they will be taken there for a visit, or for one week's tour, that you did very nice, okay, you won this prize, one week you live in firdaus, after that, go back to your home. No. Hum fiha khalidun. They will be in it forever. They will never be asked to leave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us something else about the Jannah, something totally different than our experience of this dunya. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna alladheena amanu wa amilu salihat. Those who, do, who have iman and do the good deeds, kanat lahum jannatul firdawsi nuzula. They will have the paradises of Firdaus, that is special paradise. They will have that for them <coughs> as the place to station. They will stay there. Khalidina fiha. They will stay there forever. Allah will give it to them forever. And not only that Allah will give it to them, la yabghuna an hahiwala. They would not want to move out of it. Here we have the house. No one tells us that you have to sell your house and move out. But after every some years you feel that now I need to move out of this house. Let me go and buy another house. Now this area changed. Now this neighborhood changed. Now there are better homes. Now there is something my, my needs have changed. So here you always feel, even if a person does not change his home, but at least a feeling comes, let me change. Over there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يبغون عنها حيوالا They would not want to move from that place. Allah will keep them there forever. Allah will allow them to stay forever, and they would not want to move out either. Wallahu alam, long time ago I read this, this statistic about America that I think it was 98% of the population, they move in every 10 years. Every 10 years, 98% or something like this population, they move from their homes and from one place to another. So addresses change. So it's a big business that you need the correction of the address. The companies will need to correct their addresses. So now there are companies that will sell the right address, that will track where you go. So, this is in this dunya, that everyone would like to move. But, خَالِدِينَ fiha la يَبْغُونَ anha hiwala. The beauty of Jannah is that people would not want to move from there. I think one of the things that we see with so much that we have, Subhanallah, the peace of mind as it is gone. These days, people really like to move a lot. They move their homes a lot. When you start looking at the seerah, we find that Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majmaeen, this Sahabi's house was this. Since when? How many years he lived in this house? We find that from Hijrah until he died, he lived in this house. He never moved. I think they had something blessing, blessing of Jannah over there, that they were comfortable in their homes. They were satisfied with what they had. They were content with whatever they had. And here they did not want to move back and forth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was in that house, that house, whatever house he built when he came after the hijrah, and he never moved out of it until he passed away. Allah sahaba, same way. But here we, we are not satisfied with anything. We don't get satisfied. We just want to move everything. We want to change everything. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
tells us, Ula'ika humul warithun. These are the people who would inherit the Jannah. Hum fiha khalidun. They will stay in Jannah forever. They will never be asked to leave the Jannah. And as the other ayah tells us, they would not even want to move themselves. These are seven qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned of true believers. And the reward for these qualities is that people will be inheriting the Jannah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrated a hadith where he explained the inheritance in another way also. And the hadith says, this is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas and by Sayyidina Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a space for every person in Jannah and a space for every person in Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a space for every person in Jannah and a space for every person in Jahannam. When a kafir goes to Jahannam, his space of the Jannah is empty, so a Muslim will inherit that space that kafir have left behind because that person, because of his kufr, could not make it to Jannah. He will never come there, so a mu'min will inherit his space of the Jannah. So now a mu'min, as he has his own Jannah, he got additional Jannah, additional blessings of Jannah. A kafir who went into Jahannam, and he left his space of the Jannah, of course, there is a mu'min who took his space. So this mu'min's space of the Jahannam is empty. So that kafir will have to go through the punishment of that place also. So he will be having more punishment. He will inherit that place of a mu'min in, Jan- in Jahannam. So this is why the word inheritance is used. That people will be inheriting each other's spaces. People who go to Jannah, they will inherit the space of the people of Jahannam because that space is empty. In simple words. A lot of times when, we, when people question that, you know, it has been destined if a person has to go to Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a space for every person in Jannah. Every person has a space in Jannah, even a kafir has a space there. It's only because he is too stubborn, doesn't want to come to the deen of Allah. He doesn't want to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Just because of this, he's losing that place. If he would just say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, then if this person would keep on committing the sin, no one can inherit his space because one day he is going to come out of Jahannam and go to Jannah. His space is reserved. Just this kalima. What's stopping the people from saying it? Why people are rejecting it? At least to be safe side here, everyone would like to be on the safe side. They take four or five different credit cards when they go to travel, when they go out of their town. He wants to be on the safe side. They take four or five different suits and dresses and shoes. What are you going to do? You know, who, who knows if I would need it? Everywhere we are having safe side. Why not have a safe side for Akhira? And that is at least Say the kalima. But people are even rejecting the kalima. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not forcing people into his adab, into his jahannam. It's people for, forcing themselves. Everyone's space is there in jannah. And of course, on the other hand, everyone's space is there in jahannam. Now the person would have to make his decision of where he would like to go. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when a person rejects the kalima, then a mu'min will inherit his space. And when a person, of course, through his amal and uh, getting the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person gets the jannah, so his space, his uh, punishment of the jahannam will be given to one of the kafirs that are one of the disbelievers that's over there. So, ulaika humul yibarithun. These are the inheritors who will inherit the jannah. They will inherit. So, in other words, we can say that people will go to jannah. But who would take the space of the kafir? A person with this quality not only will have his Jannah, he will get the Jannah of the others also, the empty spaces of the other, he will be given the first choice for those. Because of these qualities. These are loved qualities by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who will develop these qualities, Allah will give him his Jannah and will give him the Jannah that belong to the Kafir who did not come to Jannah. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us Jannat al-Firdaus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq that we do the deeds that will get us the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through which Allah will be pleased with us and we earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through that we receive the blessings of Allah in this, in this dunya and akhirah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Qiyamah, on the day of Hashar, and in Jannah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين